It is the ultimate Cavaliers show. The Cavs are stumbling to the stretch, but is there enough time to fix it before it's too late? Jason? A new look on the water is coming. The Cavs are building a massive practice facility along the Cuyahoga River. I got all the details we're going to talk about. And boy, does it look nice. The ultimate Cavs show starts right now. It is Jason Lloyd, Mikey McNuggets, as always on a Tuesday afternoon, getting you ready for the final stretch of the regular season for the Cleveland Cavaliers. They have 10 games remaining, Jason. They have to go 6-4 and four to reach the 50-win mark. 7-3 and three gets them to 51 wins like last season. They're coming off a win over Charlotte on Monday. But before we get to what happened on Monday and before we look ahead to Wednesday and the rest of the nine games after that, we have to go back to what happened on Sunday. It we was, yeah, we kind of do for, for the big picture outlook. We do kind of have to go back to Sunday as much as we would all like to wipe it from our memories. It was a devastating, debilitating, and quite frankly, ugly, horrific, jaw dropping loss. You can pick the adjective you want. There's no positives to take away from that game. And I think it showed some of the, maybe overall limitations of this team in whole, but then you take into consideration Donovan Mitchell wasn't playing. So can you really take anything out of a game like that? Jason, you were on the show Monday when we talked about it. So I'm curious, how do you put what happened on Sunday against Miami into context, knowing who was out, knowing who wasn't knowing the opponent and also knowing what lies ahead for this team down the final 10 games of the regular season in the postseason? Yeah, I mean, there's always bad losses, right? But this one was, I, it was it was really bad. It, they just didn't show up. Didn't show up, didn't compete. All of that applies. And, you know, I, I know that <clears throat> I, I'm not going to blame the schedule for it because at no point should a team be – should should you look like that. The schedule is not a, a valid excuse for that. But they are in the teeth of their biggest grind, really, and they're doing it without their best player. So you're going to have bad days. And, you know, I know I was talking to uh, one of the Cavs officials just yesterday. He was like, man, there has to be a better way to do this than what the Cavs have been through. It's like a different city every for the last 10 days or 12 days or something like that. 14 14 cities or 14 days, no games in the same city and back to back nights. Yeah, that's crazy. So that's and I, I listen, I'm not an NBA player. I'm certainly not a high level athlete, elite athlete. But covering the league, I know the grind that that takes. Uh, on guys and you don't get proper rest and uh, you know it just it's like an avalanche and they're right now they're at the bottom of it but that's not a good enough excuse that's not reason enough to get your doors blown off as badly as they did and you know I mean I've said it for two years now you can't just you you have to find a way to play left-handed you can't just wait for Donovan to bail you out well apparently they do apparently that's just how it is and they're just gonna have to stand there and wait for Donovan to bail them out and when he's not out there they're screwed I, I don't – I mean, do we have any evidence otherwise? Like, that's basically no. – and I don't know how it got to that point because this is a good team without Donovan. This is still a talented young team, and it's 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 been a, a terrible year for Darius, and it's, it, just, it just has been. And Mobley's had a good year. He hasn't – you know, we were talking about after the show today. He hasn't taken the massive leap that, you know, I certainly – I thought he was going to take, and many others did as well, but he hasn't – been a bust by any means he hasn't had a bad year it's just it's it's this team is just baffling on a number of levels because they're good but you expect a little bit more out of them their best pieces don't necessarily fit well together and fit is as important as talent in the nba Um, and it's just it's just sort of it's clunky it's clunky right now and they're out of time and the injuries are are a factor in that regard we talked about it a little bit on the show today What's their rotation? Do you have any idea? What if you know their rotation, please explain it to me because I don't know what it is, and there are 10 games left in the season. And I don't think J.B. Bickerstaff knows what it is, and that's a bigger issue, Jason, than you and I not knowing what it is. I was yeah. listening to the Zach Lowe podcast while I was working out today, and he was talking about how the Golden State Warriors are in a similar situation where they have 10, 11 games to go, and they don't have their rotation figured out. And if that's a team that has championship pedigree, championship success, a top 10 player in the history of the league. Yeah. And because of unforeseen circumstances, they don't know what their rotation is. And the Cavs are not, they're not built the same way the Warriors are. 
but they've dealt with similar situations throughout the season until you've gotten to the point where you have 10 games left to go in the regular season. And there is not – if anyone says they know what the rotation is, they're lying. Yeah. Because there's no way you could know based on the lack of evidence we have of what necessarily works together in totality. We know what two people pairings work better. We know Donovan and Jarrett play best as the one big – lead guard and Darius and Evan play better than Darius and Jarrett do. If those are the only two, like we understand bits and pieces of the rotation, but the big picture for whatever reason, doesn't seem to fit together. And this may be way off. And I probably even shouldn't say this. I haven't workshop this yet, Jason, but as you were discussing the clunkiness of the calves, it kind of reminded me of like a Chinese buffet in a way where like, if you want a great meal, right? You're not going to a Chinese buffet. If you're trying to win a championship. I think we could all, being realistic with each other, the Cavs probably aren't winning a championship this year at full strength. Is that is that fair? That's uh, so, fair. But they have a lot of pieces you like. Chinese buffet has a lot of different interesting options as you go along the aisle. And then you come back and you look, all right, well, four of our best players are Darius, Donovan, Jarrett, and Evan, and I'm not quite sure that they all four fit together. Hell, I'm not even 100% positive anymore that three of the four all fit together in a crunch time lineup. And that's like coming back with spare ribs, general chow chicken, Low main and 78 wontons, and you're like, well, they're all good individually, but is this the right is this the right plate for me to eat right now? Or am I gonna have terrible heartburn in four hours later? <laughs> and I kind of feel, and maybe that makes no sense. You can tell me if it does or it doesn't. actually makes perfect sense. That's kind of how I feel when I look at this cab situation, where yeah, on paper, this all works together. And even without Donovan Jason, the combination of Darius, Evan, Jarrett. Max Struess, who granted is hurt right now, and that hurts. The improvement of Isaac Okoro, we can't give him all this praise and then be like, they have nobody. Like, he, he's a person now. They and, and a coach in J.B. Bickerstaff, for all the flaws he may have, is not a terrible head coach. You know, He may not be on that same level as the, the top guys in the league, but he's not a nobody. Right. So it just doesn't make sense how they've been so bad. And I think at the end of the day, it comes back to Darius not stepping up and being the catalyst they've needed him to be when Donovan's out. But the rest of it, the reason they don't fit together, the reason guys haven't developed how I think we thought they may have, I have too many questions and I don't have answers. And I'm I'm just – I'm kind of frustrated we're not going to have time to get these answers before it's probably way too late. You're not going to have time. We're down to 10 games. And when you mentioned the Warriors, you know, I, I have a lot more faith in the Warriors figuring it out because of that championship pedigree that you mentioned. Yeah. I mean, you're a veteran – like you, you can figure it out. These guys don't have the track record or, you know, the, the data points or the history to make you believe that, okay, they can figure it out because I'm, I'm not sure that they can. Now, I think last week when we talked, it was Cavs Sixers in the first round, which is not good. Now you got Indy in that slide and who knows, it could change six times between now and the next time we do this. But, you know, I do think, Matchup is huge, obviously, in the first round. I certainly like their odds against Indiana a whole heck of a lot better than I do against Philly. And, you know, if they if they get in, well, they will get in. But when they get in, if they can get a little bit of momentum going, let's wait and see how they do. Uh, but, you know, certainly I would like to see them hold on to that Indiana pairing rather than Philly or some of the others yeah. that are lingering down there. Yeah. Yeah, and Joel Embiid's expected back by the end of the month. I don't think he's going to play on Friday when Philadelphia comes here, but he's practicing. And if he's in the lineup, that Philly team gets a whole lot tougher. Miami, after what we saw on Sunday, I want nothing to do with Miami in the postseason. I don't care if they're the 10 seed, the 9 seed. I want to stay as far away as humanly possible from them. They threw some stuff out defensively, Jason. They threw out a little half court. There is more of a three, four, three quarter court pressure and some zone against the Cavs. And granted, they Cleveland with the guys who are hurt. The guys who are out are their zone busters or their best guys to uh, attack those kind of defenses. So I will give a little bit of – a li- and I'm telling you like 1% bit of passive ag- – not passive aggressive. just he gets a pass because without Donovan and Struess, those are your two best zone busters. Yeah. But my goodness, Jason. Like it, it was like Cleveland had never seen that before. And what frustrates me the most about Sunday – and I know we'll move on to what happened yesterday in a sec. How could you be so unprepared for something as simple as a 2-3 zone? How, and they're going to see it again because all the other teams that they're going to watch now are going to have that film. Charlotte did it last night. Yeah, and they're gonna and teams are going to attack them 
And it's what we've been talking about all year. And I mean, granted, this is without Donovan, but I've said all year, teams are just going to attack Donovan. You just mm-hmm. blitz Donovan coming out of pick and roll. Let's get the ball out of his hands. And now what are you going to do? And and that's a concern. That's that's a massive concern for this team. Yeah, and we saw Miami do two things, or three really. It was the full court pressure, which if you're an NBA team, that should not phase you whatsoever. Like all these guys right. are good enough ball handlers, that should not phase you whatsoever. Right. A two three zone, it's a junk defense in the NBA. Like you play it for a possession to throw a team off and you get out of it. The fact that Miami was able to sit in it for stretches is concerning. Like, very concerning. And then the other thing they did, Jason, and this is why I go back and forth on Darius' spot in crunch time, is they started blitzing pick and rolls and forcing the Cavs to play four on three after the ball left Darius' hands. And we saw Tibbs do it in the postseason against Donovan last season. Yeah. And when you have Darius, I would like to feel good. I would like to feel confident that in a four on three offensive situation – with Darius being your secondary playmaker, you're going to get a good look more often than not. I would like to feel confident in that. Can I say I feel 100% confident? That's the result we're going to get time after time right now. I, I just can't do it with uh, with the full heart and, and, and true transparency, and that's what scares me. But we saw Miami do it. You saw Charlotte do it a little bit last night. We're going to break down some film on tomorrow's UCSS show about what they tried to do, how the Cavs adjusted. And it was some positive adjustments, but Charlotte is not Miami. Correct. And Miami is a lot closer to the teams you're going to see in the postseason than Charlotte is. So is it a fair comparison? Who knows? But it's a copycat league, Jason. You know, if it worked for Miami, other teams are going to try it until the Cavs can figure it out. Absolutely. And that's why, I mean, it, I've said it a couple times right now. If if I'm the Cavs and I'm down a bucket, or if you're down three minutes left in the game, you're down six. I don't know if Darius is on the floor for me. And if he's the highest paid player on the team, or he's got the richest contract in franchise history. And not the highest, I think Donovan's the highest paid player, but the richest contract right now in team history. And I don't know, I, I, right now I don't have him on the floor in, in the closing lineup. That is nutty. But that's just uh, how the season has gone. Yeah, I still. I know you want him. I, it, because of that, but I, I'm also, like, I'm not going to die on that hill. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I've come off the two-big lineup, and that was the hill I thought I would die on where those two had to be on the court together. I've I've, I've left that hill. That hill yeah. is now a flat plane. <laughs> the hill that I'm standing on for Darius still being crunch time, I think it's still a hill, but the resistance of the hill is at, like, 20% grade, not a 90% grade like it once was. Jason, before we talk about some of their counters we saw on Monday and Marcus Morris and whether or not this is too late, I do want to do a quick preview of what's coming up later on the week on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show channel. Check out Earl and the Ultimate 216 Show on Thursday. Check out Behind the Glass on Wednesday. And check out the Ultimate Brown Show on Friday with G. Bush. Also, if you missed the Ultimate Guardian Show on Monday with Zach and Bull, make sure you go check it out. Jason, let's play this out both sides, the good and the bad, okay? Yep. We'll do the good first, then we'll do the bad, then we'll talk about Marcus Morris and the new practice facility. What happens if Cleveland goes on a run like the Miami Heat did last season, where they had zero playoff expectations. Cleveland obviously won't be a playing team like Miami was, but they ended up reaching the NBA Finals. If Cleveland goes, let's even say, to the Eastern Conference Finals, Mm -hmm. is JB safe? Is Kobe safe? Is Donovan coming back? Play out the whole scenario of what the Cavs' offseason looks like if they make it at least to the Eastern Conference Finals. If they go to the Conference Finals, I think JB's safe. I think Kobe's safe. The Donovan piece is we just don't know. Like, and again, I'll go back. I'll point to Kawhi. Kawhi Leonard won a freaking championship yeah. and still left. Said he didn't want to be in Toronto and left anyway. So it really comes down to a guy's desires. And I know from who I talk to around the league, I know what the feeling is. And the feeling is not good for Cavs fans. But, you know, a deep, successful postseason run, maybe that changes things. I think one of my kids' iPads is going off. Sorry. Their iPads are in my office. Um I should probably mute that, huh? Yeah, let me. Uh, I, I'll give you my scenario if things go well. You All don't right, mute that. Real quick. I'll be right back. All right. If the Cavaliers make a run to at least the Eastern Conference Finals, if not the NBA Finals, JB gets an extension, Kobe gets an extension, and Donovan, it's in his best interest at that point to re-sign long-term here in Cleveland. 
whether this regular season or not has been a true indication of what some of his running mates and Darius and Evan and Jarrett and so on and so forth can actually be and actually are moving forward or whether it's just been a weird drop off and year from hell for, uh, for Darius and Jarrett uh, Evans dealt with injuries. Who knows? But if you make it to the Eastern Conference Finals, I have a hard time believing there's a better basketball situation out there than Cleveland coming off a run that deep into the playoffs. I just can't fathom whether it's Brooklyn or Miami or going to be the third fiddle in L.A. with LeBron and A.D. <sighs> Those aren't better basketball situations for Donovan Mitchell than what he would have here in Cleveland. Now the coaching, the front office, all that, that'll be sorted out later. But you can't move on from a coach who reaches the Eastern Conference Finals. And Kobe, if he gets Donovan to resign, he's probably here for a while too, Jason. That's how I see the best case scenario of this playing out for Cleveland. Yeah, thanks for stalling for me. Um, You're welcome. I'm good I, at that. I, I said on the show today, I keep trying to write how Donovan's best path forward is to sign the extension and stay here. But I can't justify that right now. Like, what yeah. what evidence has the guys around him given him that this is his best opportunity? Even though he's played – it's in, <laughs> it's indisputable. He's played the best basketball of his career in Cleveland these last two years. If you look at his numbers, look at his on-court performance, um, and you would like to say that he's got a great young team around him that's only going to keep getting better and better and better. This year, I don't know that really has – they've put their best foot forward, though, on, on that path. But if they go to the conference finals – I, I I think he should sign the extension. And again, it just buys him a year. It doesn't, you're not yeah. committing to Cleveland for four or five years. You're committing for one more year. It gives them next year to take another shot at this, to take another run at this, just to, see, to see how you do. Uh, but, you know, I do think JB is safe. I do think Kobe's safe. Uh, if they make it, if they win two rounds of the playoffs, it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard to move on from people after last year's debacle, the way it ended. If you come back, and, and they have the talent to do this, by the way. Absolutely. The matchups Absolutely. coming up. As bad as it looks recently and as bad as, like, I know that Miami game looks a bad taste in people's mouth, this is still a good team. And they still have the talent to go on a run like this. Now, I don't think they can beat Milwaukee and Boston in the same postseason in advance to the NBA Finals. I think the conference finals is their absolute ceiling. Uh, but they can for sure. They could do that. They could. They could get hot and do that. Yeah, I see Bulls in the chat here saying the Cavs are a disaster. So appreciate Bull for tuning in. Make sure if you missed it, go check out Bull's podcast with Zach on the Ultimate Guardian show. It is up on our YouTube channel. I do think long-term basketball only, the Cavs do make a lot of sense for Donovan. But I told you guys on Monday, I mentioned to you after the show, Jason, I thought this whole season was kind of an audition for Donovan long-term here in Cleveland. Hey, what do I have in a coach? How aggressive is this front office going to be putting a team around me, surrounding with the talent I need to fully succeed here with the Cavaliers? Is Darius a number two option? Can Evan Mobley develop into a guy I can be looked at as a peer and not an understudy moving forward? And frankly, so far this season, and, and things can change, the playoffs can completely rewrite the script and change the narrative of all of this. Darius has not passed the I could be a second guard, I could be your number two option barometer. If anything, he's taking a step back this season. It could just be a blip in the radar for his career, or it could be this is kind of who he is now as a secondary playmaker. Evan Mobley has gotten better. He's by no means a bust. If he never gets any better in basketball, he will be a 10- to 15-year pro and have a very productive NBA career, but he hasn't taken that leap forward from promising young player to star like a lot of guys do in year three. I don't think J.B. Bickerstaff has proven he's a top-tier Spo. Steve Kerr, Greg no. Popovich level coach. Yeah. And if those are the things you needed to see from this Cleveland organization to sign on long-term, I don't think you've seen it yet. That doesn't mean he won't. It doesn't mean we can't change the script come post with a heroic playoff performance, Jason. But if those were the things you were counting on to happen that you needed to see to sign your name on paper, I don't think it's happened yet. I agree. And that's why, I mean, if he comes to them, I'm not saying he's going to do this. 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 But if Donovan says, I'll stick, but we got to make changes here, here, and here. If they'll make changes there, there, and there. 100%. He's, he's got all the leverage right now on this, and he knows that. Yeah. And I, if, if he resigns, the roster is his. Yeah. Whatever moves that have to be made, nobody is safe. Yeah. Outside of Donovan. There could be 11 new players on the Cavs next season. Outside of Donovan and Amani Bates for G. Bush. 
We'll keep Imani. Everyone else is on the table, but they got to put together a roster around Donovan Mitchell to his liking at that yeah. point. And we'll so. see. And I mean, are we going to do worst case scenario or, you, or is that enough doom and gloom for the day? Uh, real quick, just because we did best case, let's do worst case. Let's say they lose in the first round of the playoffs. Uh, we ass- fair, fair to assume J.B. Bickerstaff would be fired Yes, if they lose in the first round of the playoffs. I, if they lose in the first round of the playoffs, all bets are off. J.B., I think, becomes under – J.B. is gone. I think J.B.'s fired. Um, Kobe, I think, comes under scrutiny depending on what Donovan decides. If Donovan says, I'm out, Kobe's got a lot of explaining to do when yeah. you uh, trade all the draft picks that they traded, all the talent that they traded to make that deal, and you don't win one series in two years with this guy. That's that's it's hard to it's hard to account for that. And so then I think Kobe probably is scrambling a little bit too. And and really, they've done a nice job. Like I when they first started this rebuild, nobody in town was harder on them than I was mm-hmm. because I didn't like the, the way that it ended. The LeBron era ended. I didn't think that they went all in. I hated the Kyrie trade. We're not going to relitigate that now. But the first two years after he left were a disaster, and they were trying to win, and they couldn't get anything right. Since then, they've done a really nice job of roster building and putting pieces together, finding guys on the margin, developing talent, all that stuff. They've really done a nice job with that. But that Donovan trade, if he leaves, is like a wrecking ball coming in where you've traded five years away of control of your draft for a guy who's not going to be here. And, you know, if if they got a – the finals appearance out of it, then you live with it. Yeah. Make the conference finals appearance out of it. You don't love it, but it's something. It's something. Two first round exits, though, yeah. is a disaster. And I, and that's the barrel that they're staring down if the, if that happens. I used the Chinese buffet analogy earlier, Jason. What happens with this? <laughs> another food analogy. Like going to a steakhouse and all the sides are pretty good, but the steak is way overcooked, right? Like you're not going back. You're not yeah. going back. So yeah. this whole. You know, I, I agree with you that if they lose in the first round, a coaching change is probably necessary. Uh, they've done a really good job. Like, they, they have done a lot of good things that don't necessarily get talked about on a regular basis, that don't go, uh, don't get put on the forefront. But they have done a pretty good job developing fringe talent, turning guys like Dean Wade into something pretty valuable. Yeah. But two first round losses, uh, two first round ex- exits, excuse me, with the expectations they've had going all in for Donovan, you just, you need more, and if it's not going to be JB to get it, you can look at someone else. Look at look at Philadelphia last season. They lost in the Eastern Conference semifinals to Boston. That wasn't enough to keep Doc Rivers around. He has an NBA championship on his belt. So sometimes a new voice is just needed to try and maximize the roster. As for Kobe, I think his fate is all dependent on what happens with Donovan Mitchell. If Donovan wants out, a new GM has to be the one to come in and try and figure out what to do, how to make the best of that situation because Kobe had his chance and he's kind of handcuffed in a lot of ways to the Donovan situation. I'm not even saying it's all his fault if it goes south, but uh, it'd be a hard-pressed situation to come in, trade five years of draft picks, three young players, see what Laurie Markkinen's turned into in Utah, and then be like, hey, he was here for two years. We're going to recoup 60% on what we invested, and I'm going to still be the guy to lead the ship. So it – Six percent's high. They're going to get about twenty five percent back. Hey, he's still. They get three first rounders at least. You think they get three first rounders for one year of control? I hope you're right. Oh, I forgot it's one year control. One year of control. I think you get one first rounder. I think you get no, 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 no. Listen, if Dorian Finney Smith was up for two first rounders at the trade deadline, then Donovan's up for three. Okay, I hope you're right. Now you're making me scared. I hope you're right. One year of control. You're making one me year. Scared. Now, if you, if you send him to a place that he wants to go and he's willing to extend, you know, maybe you get more. But if you're training a guy with one year left on his contract. Uh, there's no – look at some of the – they traded Davis Bertans for a first. Donovan has to be worth more than a first. Okay. I'm going with, I'm going with three. I'm, I'm going to stick at three. We'll see what the team is. But I'm, I'm going to go with two, but I don't think – Two and a player. shocked if they get three. Two and a player, but okay. Regardless, that is what the worst case scenario for the Cavs. Make sure you check out Ultimate 216 show on Thursday, Ultimate Brown show on Friday, Ultimate Guardian show on Monday on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show channel. Yesterday, Jason, we saw the Cavs bounce back very nicely against the Charlotte Hornets. Marcus Morris got ejected 
for a flagrant two unnecessary roughness foul. We talked about him last week, what he brings to this team, the toughness, the grit, the FU mentality that we hope Jared Allen and Evan Mobley could pick up along the way. I'm not sure he needed to bring out that card against the Charlotte Hornets as opposed to some of the other teams. I do think sometimes uh, you got to fight with the teams you know you'll be competing with, not picking down. I'm not saying it was a bully move by any means. It lit a spark. It worked. So let's go. But who thought Marcus Morris would be the guy we'd be praising coming off a win over Charlotte as the guy who lit the spark for this team when we didn't even think they would really need it against Charlotte? He's going to be around for a while. I think he's going to be around uh, as long as the Cavs are around this year. I think Marcus Morris is around. He sort of leaped Tristan, hasn't he, already in terms of playing time? Yeah, I mean, he's playing more of the four than the five, Tristan. But, yeah, I mean, he played seven minutes last night because he got ejected, but he was on pace to play way more. I just think um, – I, I think I think in a playoff series – I think they're going to look Marcus look at Marcus before they look at Tristan right now. And and I thought a couple weeks ago, I thought Tristan was could could play a role in a playoff series for this team. And it kind of feels like Marcus is stealing that. I just like the brand of physicality that it brings, the ability to make some shots, um, and just the the toughness physical factor. You know, I was talking to some people around the organization, just asking, could Tristan help him? And the response I got was, yeah, Tristan can help. Like. He's going to muck things up. He, you know, and, and I am talking Tristan, but I'm going to tie it back to Marcus. Mm-hmm. Tristan, he's not going to give you 20, 25 minutes in a playoff game, but he can give you four or five good ones and shove some guys, throw some bodies around, hit somebody in the mouth, figuratively or literally, and maybe that jolts Evan a little bit. And that energizes Evan, who's very passive, who's very quiet. But Marcus could be that guy. I mean, the conversation is about Tristan, but Marcus fits that as well, maybe yeah. even better. So I think he's going to be here for a while, and I think he can hold a role for this team going forward, an important role. Yeah, I'm going to keep this real short because I want to get to the new facility stuff, Jason, but I've liked what I saw from him so far. I like the four threes he hit against Indiana, the toughness, the grit. I, I do think he's an a-hole, and I mean that in the best way possible, not personally, but the way he plays, mm-hmm. and that's something this team desperately needs, and it's going to come down to the postseason for the Cavs. We could keep saying it time and time again with the Browns. It all comes down to Deshaun for the Cavs. It all comes down to what they do in the playoffs. Yep. And if push comes to shove, if things get physical, the refs are calling fewer and fewer fouls now. Can they handle the physicality? Well, if things get chippy, I want Marcus Morris on my side to be the one backing up Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. Jason, let's talk a little bit about this new practice facility. You were unable to be at the official unveiling because you were on air with us. But per usual, you had all this information well before it came. Uh, available. So tell us what you know about this new practice facility as I show the good people out there some pictures of what this new thing's going to look like. It's going to be awesome. It's on the land that Dan bought over a decade ago where originally phase two of the casino was supposed to be. Now it's going to be this private public type uh, entity. Dan and the Cleveland Clinic are going to pay for the whole thing themselves. It's It ranges into the nine figures, I was told. So hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and the, the Cavs, it'll be, you know, they're leaving independence and they're going to go here, but then also the public component, whether you're a weekend warrior, uh, trying to improve golf game, you got a kid into sports, baseball, basketball, football, there'll be ways to, that you can go up and go to this thing and they'll measure sort of the biometrics of your body movement, show you areas, you know, hip flexibility, whatever. And also like the clinic is in charge of the clinic side of it. And there could just be, you could have checkup post post op surgery checkups at this thing, so it's very much going to be a public function as well. Um, and you see there the the kayaks. Cleveland has never taken advantage of the waterfront, and it's baffling the way that they've just totally botched the lakefront, the Cuyahoga River, the river we all know has had problems in the past with pollution. It's all been cleaned up, um, but there's really no great ways to access it. Part of what the Cavs are going to do is have a kayak port of entry where you can get in the water paddleboard kayaks whatever you want uh and be able to use the water that way the land right now it's just blight i drove down there yesterday there's nothing uh, yeah there's nothing there and it's it's hard to get to it's hard to reach you can't really yeah. you definitely can't walk there and so they've got to add some infrastructure there they're going to make it a little bit easier to get to it uh but it's it's going to be beautiful like you know i said on the show today dan and i have gone round and round we've certainly had our differences in the past 
But the one thing that guy does is spends money and spends it at an elite level. Uh, the, the When they built Cleveland Clinic Courts and in Independence, it was state-of-the-art. This thing is going to blow that out of the water. It's 210,000 square feet, four times the size of their current place. Uh, now, again, some of that, not all of that is going to be theirs. Part of that, that counts everything, public part, private part, all of it. And this is sort of the new trend now. Boston has done it uh, with Emory, the big hospital system out there. Orlando has done it with Advent Health in Florida. San Antonio has done it with a medical partner down there. This is sort of the new wave, especially in the NBA, of how these things are going. And when the Cavs toured all these facilities, one thing that they were told what, by all of them was, we wish we went bigger. We, we wish that we would have you know, future-proofed this more or less and been able to grow into it. <clears throat> so the Cavs one is going to be by far the biggest in the NBA. And it's going to be massive and a place for them to grow into. One cool thing I was told was, there's going to be, they have three full size courts in here. It's going to have weight room, film room, all that stuff, lavish locker rooms, everything you'd expect. But there's also, and this is for the players, not the public, but there's going to be a half court LED board where you can fl flip a couple switches and pull up Madison Square Garden. And it's like you're shooting in the garden on the garden's hoops with the, with the setting, with the stands, with the music. It's just like being in the garden with this big LED board behind you. Uh, any any arena in the NBA. So that's really cool. I'd like to see that go to the fan side too. It'd be yeah. really something cool for the fans to do. But just there's just a lot of unique elements to this, aspects of this. They're going in front of the city planning commission in a few weeks, middle of next month. Uh, they hope to break ground by the end of the year. Their current lease and in independence expires in 2026. And they'll move into this thing either late 26 or uh, 2027. They are hopeful yeah. to have this completed. And it's going to be beautiful. The pictures look tremendous. We're going to read a few fan comments here. Jason will wrap it up. Uh, Ian says, if I'm the Cavs and Mitchell agrees to extend, I'd be willing to move anyone on the roster. I do think that is on the table. H.C. Cummings says, J.B. Bickerstaff is average at best. Dan says, how much is on the coaching staff? Why isn't Mobley better? I think they have done a pretty good job developing Mobley. It's just taking slower than I think some would want and also yeah. he may not have that high-end number one guy on a championship roster potential he may just be a really good solid nba player not a game-changing franchise-changing talent is that fair yeah yeah that's fair uh evan 419 says mobley and dg for a disgruntled luca who says no there's a big sylvanian population here in cleveland jason would the dallas mavericks agree to that trade no dallas says no luca's far and away better than either of those two guys uh okay. in the nba 50 cents does not equal two quarters or a dollar Evan, does not equal four quarters. I do know Evan. He's definitely being sarcastic on that, but it is a good idea. Uh, Ian says, I think JB should be gone regardless. It feels like groundhog day with him. He says, if Mitchell is determined to leave, no matter what Cavs should consider just tearing it down and getting back whatever assets they can. Not ideal, but otherwise you're stuck in purgatory. I disagree with that. I don't think you're tearing it down. You still got a really young, talented roster. Um, I think that you, they, they do have to look and see how these pieces fit. Yeah, And I think if, if Donovan does leave, I think you have to stop trying to put another ball dominant guard next to Darius. You know, try and go. He's got to be the one. He's got to be the guy with the ball. Yeah. Go the more traditional shooting guard route. Darius had a monster year when he didn't have Colin next to him, when he didn't have Donovan next to him. Uh, he had his best year. So let him be the point guard, bring in a, a more traditional two guard and go with it. Uh, just a couple more. Evan said it's not five picks. Sure, we don't have control, but the swap, we still have picks. Yeah, I mean, the, the pick swaps, but you don't have the better of two. You lose control option. of your draft for yeah. five consecutive years. You, you're right. You do have two first-round picks. They're likely going to be pretty low in the first round. but you know, uh, Yeah, they still got four years of five years of control. Trade to Brooklyn for some of those future Phoenix picks down the line, and I saw someone say throw Cam Johnson in a trade with that. Ian said uh, hypothetical trade Cam Johnson and some picks. We will see how it uh, pans out but we got to see how the playoffs pan out first and a good playoff performance will save all of us from the headache of trying to figure out hypothetical trades for Donovan Mitchell. So fingers crossed, please, please, please Cleveland, give us some basketball content to talk about deep into the summer and not the chaos of a coaching search and a complete potential tear down. I'm so sick of talking about the Browns just for the sake of, so we don't have to talk about the Browns. <laughs> there was something else to talk about. Awesome. Another episode of the Ultimate Cap Show is in the books. Jason, appreciate you as always, and we will see you all tomorrow on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. Peace.